It is so much fun to do these on Easter morning when there are so many children to say hi to. It's good to see you all today on a beautiful sunny day on an Easter Sunday when we celebrate our Savior. I have my teddy bear with me today. Here he is. You notice something about my teddy bear? He's wearing a bow tie. That's right, he is. And also, he's not alive. There is nothing that my teddy bear can do unless I make him do it. If I lie him down right here and leave him there, he will not move until I come and pick him up again. I put him on top of my file cabinet in my office, and there he sits waiting for me to come and pick him up because he can't do anything by himself. That's the way Jesus was on Easter Friday when he died on the cross. He died to take all of our sins away. And he really was dead. He could not be alive anymore because that was the cost for our sins. But he was alive on Easter. He was alive on Easter. What happens then is they put him into the tomb. The men and the women put him there to make sure he was taken care of. And they rolled that big stone in front of the opening and they went away and they were sad. But you know what happened? Yeah, when the women, when the women came to the, to the grave on early on Easter morning, what did they find? They were not, he, was not there. he was not there. That's right. He was gone. He had risen. Some angels were there to tell him what happened, but Jesus wasn't there anymore. And now he lives in heaven, and he lives in our hearts for us, and he watches over and keeps us in all that we do. And we get to go tell people that Jesus is alive. What a wonderful privilege that is. Let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to the earth and taking our sins on yourself on the cross. Thank you for taking our punishment and your our punishment in place of us. Please bless and watch over us as we remember that you are alive, that you live for us, and that one day we get to come and live with you. Help us to tell others about that and be with us as we celebrate your resurrection. In your name we pray. Amen. God's word for our Easter festival sermon is recorded for us in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 19. We're going to hear about the crown jewel of the Christian faith, the resurrection of the body. This is what the Bible says. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom of God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is God's word, we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, O Lord, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Dear Christian friends, it's one of the most important truths of the Christian faith. It's just that, well, many people I've talked with over the last couple of years, well, they just have it wrong. That truth has to do with this. What will life be like for us as believers when we die and we go to heaven and we're living with God for all eternity? Will we be spirits floating on the cloud, all playing harps in perfect tone? Or will we be singing hymns in a worship service that never ends? If you read the Bible, neither of these are correct. God's plan for our eternity has less to do with what you see on the Cartoon Network and more to do with what we read about the perfect Garden of Eden back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. 
Each week here at St. Paul's, we confess this amazing, important truth. And we'll say it again in the Apostles' Creed right after this sermon, like we have so many times before. It's a phrase we often say, but now I want, from now on, I want you to focus on it. That phrase is this, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Sure, we say it, but do we actually always believe it? And do we always grasp its full significance? It's actually an Easter truth, isn't it? I believe in the resurrection of the body. It's God's greatest gift to us. You could call it the crown jewel of the Christian faith. And failing to recognize its great value would be tragic indeed. Here's why I say that. Back in 1905, a miner by the name of Frederick Wells was walking underground in a mine shaft that he supervised. As he walked through that dark path, a flash caught his attention. Curious, he stopped and he saw a large glassy object in the wall of that mine shaft. Using his pocket knife, he pried it out of the wall. As he held that large stone in his hand, his first thought was, this is big, but this is too big to be real. But what if, what if it were real? You need to know that Frederick was standing in the premier diamond mine of South Africa. Frederick Wells took that huge stone, that large chunk, uh, about the size of your fist, up to the office, up to the surface. And when he checked it in, in the office, the inspectors took an initial look at it, and in their initial look, they too said, this is too big. This is too big to be real. They dismissed it as a worthless piece of glass, of worthless crystal. But upon further investigation, they determined it was real. It was a dazzling diamond of amazing size and clarity. Actually, the weight was 3,106 carats. Ladies, can you imagine wearing a rock like that on your hand? It probably would take the whole MVL football team to help you carry it. Guys, can you imagine giving your sweetie that gift? Imagine the payments that you would have to make. But just imagine about if Frederick Wells would have listened to that initial report of those inspectors, if he would have said it was worthless and he would have thrown away the world's largest diamond. Oh, that would be a tragedy and an epic fail. But failing to recognize what it means when we say I believe in the resurrection of the dead would be an even greater tragedy, an even bigger epic fail. Three days ago, we were right here at St. Paul's. We heard eyewitness accounts about how Jesus, God's son and our human brother, bled and died, and his body was buried in a dark tomb, a rock tomb, and the stone was moved in front of it. That's it, the over, the end. Not so. Because you and I have gathered together more than 2,000 years later. Because Jesus rose from the dead. He physically walked out of the grave. And we joyfully celebrate that fact because that event of Easter Sunday Jesus coming alive, not like a teddy bear just staying in the darkness, but him walking out of the tomb, that has significance that reverberates down to you and me today. Jesus' death and resurrection had a very specific purpose. The Apostle Paul tells us exactly why that happened in the great resurrection chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, for de since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I hope you see what Paul is doing here. 
He's not only explaining Easter, he's describing what it means when we say, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And to do that, Paul is using a contrast between the first man, Adam, and the second man, Jesus Christ. The first words that Paul spoke here actually hold in them all the tragedy that, that you and I have to deal with here in this world. But simultaneously, these opening words hold all the triumph of what Easter means and waiting for you and me and every Christian believer. The Apostle Paul's point is simple. When our first father, Adam, died, he brought sin into the world. And sin not only affected him, it affected all creation for all time. But when Adam sinned, it also brought the judgment for sin, the penalty for sin, death, not just to his family, but every single person who would ever be born. And it's true. You and I, every single human being, we're born sinners. I think I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, thanks a lot, Father Adam. Thanks for making us sinners. Oh, but don't be so arrogant. It's not just that we're born sinners. It's that you and I sin more than we realize and more than we care to admit. It's when we fail only as fathers can. It's when we as mothers, we make the mistakes that only moms can make. It's when we don't live up to being the kids and teens that God has created us to be. And as we grow older, instead of being Christian wells of wisdom, of Christian patience, we allow our hearts to become jaded and filled with pessimism or worry. Oh, sure, we shine up nice on an Easter Sunday. All of you look amazing. But we can't hide the deep need that we have. There is no doubt about it, even though others may never see our brokenness, you and I, we are our father Adam's children. And every day that we spend here on planet Earth, it's one day closer to the end. You and I are going to die. Oh, we can pretend it's not going to happen, and the rest of the world acts like, what's the big deal? But you and I need to face the fact we can run from death, but we certainly can't hide. And we certainly can't make ourselves right with God to face God when we see him one day. But that's what makes the events of that first Holy Week so important. That's what makes the God-man Jesus so special. The good news of Easter is even though we are broken and we are sinful, God loves us more than words can say. God loves us so much that he sent into motion a plan to save us and rescue us from ourselves, from this broken world, and yes, from death itself. Jesus became one of us so he could right everything Adam did wrong. Jesus came to, to become one of us so that he could die in our place. And in dying in our place, he gave us eternal life, freely and fully. Really, Jesus descended in the darkness like Frederick Wills did with that mine. But when he came back, oh, Jesus brought something worth far more valuable than a diamond. He brought with him eternal life for all those sinners who believe. That's because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. But wait, there's more. This is what Paul said. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. Maybe you didn't realize it, but on that very first Easter, that was a big day on the Jewish calendar. It was actually the Jewish festival of first fruits. Every God fearing Jewish man or woman would bring part of their crops from their fields as farmers. They would bring them out of thanks for what God had given them. The significance of the first fruits is the people knew and believed and trusted that if they got those first fruits, something more 
would come. Do you see Paul's comparison and why he says that here? The resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits. More is coming. His resurrection actually guarantees ours, not that you and I are going to be spirits floating around in heaven playing our harps, not because we're going to be singing every hymn in the hymn book and then start over at the beginning. Oh no. The Bible says we believe in the resurrection of the body. That means something. When you, you and I, when we die, if Jesus doesn't return, when Jesus returns on Judgment Day, he's going to raise every single body. And you and I, as God's people, we're going to have the bodies that we have, and we're going to spend all eternity with Jesus. Just think about how it worked after Jesus' resurrection. His disciples could recognize him. They could see him. They could talk with him. They could walk with him. They could laugh with him. That is going to be us. Because Jesus lives, our bodies are going to come back. The resurrection of Jesus is just like the first fruits. It guarantees every Christian believer a resurrected body just like his. But just think what that means, not just for us. When you say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, you're saying something big. Because you and I need something big. Every single one of us here, including me, has had loved ones that have died. Maybe it was your mom or dad brother or sister, maybe it was even her son or daughter. And it hurts more than words can say. There's that big hole, the size of that diamond in our hearts because they're not there. But you know what it means when you say, I believe in the resurrection of the body? Because Jesus lives, we don't have to hope that that loved one who believed in Jesus, who's died, has just stopped existing. That loved one of ours who believes in Jesus is right now in heaven. They're absolutely perfect, and that body is going to come back to life. Their soul in heaven is going to resurrect with the body someday. That body that you maybe saw lowered into the ground into the grave is going to come and res be resurrected by Jesus. That body's going to come up to us, talk with us, laugh with us, and be with us forever. Because of Jesus' resurrection, Death is not the end. To use an English punctuation phrase, death is not a period. Final. It's actually just a comma. It means something more is coming because Jesus' resurrection guarantees the first fruits. Yes, the huge diamond that Frederick Wells discovered in South Africa, that was a big deal. It was named the Cullinan Diamond after the mine's owner. And of course, he sure wanted that diamond. And so plans were set to transport that diamond from South Africa back to England. But if you're going to be able to transport such a valuable piece of jewelry, aren't you a little worried it would be stolen? <laughs> so was the owner of the mine. And so royal officials were sent to escort that diamond back and in a steamship under armed guard that it was placed in the captain's own safe. But all that was a diversion. The real di diamond wasn't on the ship. While the world's attention was on that steamship, the diamond made its way back in a very ordinary way. Actually, it was sent in the mail. That's right, the greatest diamond ever discovered was sent parcel post. I just wonder how many people who handled that package never recognized or grasped what they were holding. The Cullen and Diamond was eventually cut up into 99 pieces, and we know it today as the crown jewels. The estimate of the value of all those crown jewels was more than $2 billion. Do you know how much the British had to pay for those crown jewels? Nothing. They were a free gift. You know, here's my point. Sometimes the best things in life come in small packages 
The best gift from God, eternal life, comes in the strongest of phrases. I believe in the resurrection of the body. From now on, when you say that phrase, it's actually part of the third article of the Apostles' Creed that we'll confess. Don't just go through the motions when you say that. That phrase isn't going to help you. And don't just say that phrase like it's one of those a people, like a person would say, I hope it's okay, even though I'm not quite so sure, and it probably isn't going to be okay. Say that phrase confidently, because it means more to us than, a, than the cullen and diamond. This phrase packs power, because do we or don't we believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? That phrase isn't empty, because look, my friends, Jesus' tomb already is. When minor Frederick Wells found this huge jewel, he thought to himself, what if? The Apostle Paul asked the same question. Only listen to how he phrased it. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. In other words, if all we have is to know Jesus just for this life, then all we have is being able to come together on Easter Sunday, sing a few hymns, see a few more people, eat some Easter breakfast, dress up in our Easter best, but if that's all we have, we just have something worthless. But you and I know better. The Holy Spirit has led us to believe, yes, because Jesus lives, I believe in the resurrection of the body. It's a glorious pivot from despair to hope because Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, Easter means that no one loses eternally who believe in Jesus. Because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And the only thing anybody can say to that is amen.